So my assignment uh, this evening is to pursue the question of do we worship Christ? And the speedy and reflexive answer that a Christian would give is, of course we do. Of course we worship the Lord. But there is a uh, an el element of controversy about this subject because really what we're wrestling with is the Trinity. I thought about this a little bit. It's, it has to do with the Godhead, doesn't it? It has to do with what the Bible teaches about the Trinitarian doctrine. If you search in an English Bible for the words worship Christ or Jesus or give thanks to Jesus or Christ, it's not found there. And that's interesting. You would think that you would find those commands in the Scripture. It's characteristic in the denominations. For, I'm sure you've seen this. They will hold their hands up and they will say, Jesus, we worship you. And that's not found in Scripture. And part of what we're going to do is investigate whether that's an appropriate thing to say, and, and maybe we'll have some opinions in the Q&A. But that's kind of where we're headed this evening. Here's our outline, and it's in the handout that you have. We're first going to touch on what is worship. Secondly, establish that Jesus is God. Thirdly, ask the question if Jesus denied his divinity while he was on earth. Wonder if Jesus was worshipped in Scripture. Does Scripture command? Point number five is very important. Does Scripture command us to worship Jesus? And then finally, answer the question, should we or, or do we? The first part of the study then is, what is worship? And you might not think this is important, but it is a dominant theme in the Scripture. And there are several terms in the Hebrew Scriptures, which I didn't really study, and several in the Greek, which we will look at. Worship is a deep sense of awe, religious awe, that expresses itself in scriptural acts of devotion and service. I had a friend in high school, and in the sixth grade, I believe it was, I stayed the weekend with him, and we stayed up all night talking about various things. We talked about whether, whether Sasquatch was real, and uh, I asked him to go to church at one point, and Danny told me that the best kind of worship is when you're outdoors and you're communing with nature. That was the first time I'd ever experienced that attitude. I'm sure you've heard it from people. Is that correct? Uh, other people say that you should worship at a rock concert. That's a wonderful place to worship. Or uh, Orthodox uh, religionists, denominational religionists might say that you must go to a great cathedral to worship God and, and Christ. Back in Genesis, though, this question it comes up in the very beginning in Genesis chapter 4. There were two brothers that were engaging in worship. Abel, by faith, because he listened to God, made a more excellent sacrifice, Hebrews 11.4. But Cain brought of the fruit of the ground, for which God had not asked. And then we learn in this verse, in this event, that God did not respect Cain and his offering. Isn't that surprising? It would be surprising to some in the religious world that God approves of some worship and disapproves of other worship. Listening is important. We learn in Peter's first epistle that we are a holy priesthood and we offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to this verse a little later. Spiritual sacrifices which are acceptable to God. And that, of course, implies that some spiritual sacrifices aren't acceptable. This theme was touched on by our Lord Jesus Christ. He met a woman at a well. We're all familiar with this event. And she wanted to know what worship is pleasing to God. Is it Mount Gerizim, as we say, or is over in Jerusalem, as the Jews say? Can you settle this for me, she asked the Lord. And the Lord said, The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship must worship Him in spirit and truth. The Lord told us there are three elements that are necessary for a true worshiper. The first is God, and that is the object of our worship. We must worship the correct object. Many people worship themselves. The second thing that we must have is the correct attitude. We worship in spirit, so we come with our hearts prepared to worship God. And finally, we must have the truth. Our actions must be grounded in the scripture. And so we ask, is there a pattern for scriptural worship so that we can direct our worship to God 
as it is pleasing, so it is pleasing to Him, and yes, there is. The Church of Christ in the Scriptures uh, is easily found by the devout student. It is possible to know the mind of God, the mind of Christ, on this theme. And we all know that there are elements in the uh, church that have been established in Scripture. We observe the Lord's Supper, Acts 20. We pray to God, 1 Corinthians 14. We sing songs to the Lord, Ephesians 5. We give contribution and we teach and read the Scripture, Colossians 4. Those are the elements of true worship. And we must not think beyond what is written. Isn't that a, a human characteristic? To think beyond what is written. To assume that our wants and our dislikes are more important than God's. We try to adapt God's church to match our expectations, our cultural expectations. Young people remember that. The culture's changing. God's church is not. So we stand fast and we hold the traditions which we have been taught. So that is worship. And I'm, I'm looking at this question of do we worship Jesus as Christians in that context. That is the context that I'm going to answer this question is, and that is in the worship of the church. And so our second point then is Jesus is God. And there's no way I could comprehensively investigate every scripture concerning the divinity of Christ, but I think we must address this to delve into this question. Scripture teaches there is one God, but the divine nature is shared by three distinct personalities, and they're revealed in the New Testament as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each of the three personalities is eternal and equal in essence, although they may assume individual roles in their respective work. We could go to many places to study who, uh, who Christ is, but I wanted to go to Hebrews. We studied through Hebrews recently here at Rice Road, and I thought it would be worthwhile uh, to study, uh, to look at the verses in Hebrews that concern this issue. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. We read there, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Isn't it an amazing passage? And the Hebrew writer wants us to know that Jesus is part of the Godhead. He was fully involved in the creative work of God, verse 2. So he's an agent of creation. And then verse 3 tells us five things about Jesus, and I want to notice three of those. The first one is that Jesus is the brightness of God's glory, the radiance of the glory of God. This word is apugasma, and it means to supremely emit the glory of the Godhead. Jesus is the effulgent glory of the Godhead. He is the brilliance of of God. He is the luminosity of God. He is the radiant flux. He is the bright lux of God. Secondly, the Hebrew writer tells us that Jesus is the express image of his person, the exact representation of God's being. The ESV renders this the exact imprint of his nature. And this word, the first word there is character, from which we get our word character, and it means like a stamp or an engraving, like this hand in bronze here. Jesus is perfect to the last detail in God's character. The imprint of God's person is hypostasis in the Greek, and Arndt Gingrich and Bauer tells us this refers to the actual being, the underlying reality of something. So Jesus is the underlying reality of God. You might say, pull up the floorboards of God's house, and underneath you find the foundation, the concrete, and that is Jesus. Jesus was never out of the picture. He was not created. He is a co-sharer. He is eternal. He's exact imprint, the hypostasis, the essence of God. He is not lesser than God because He is God. And then the third thing that I wanted to notice from this passage is that Jesus upholds all things by the word of his power. Jesus is the upholder, the sustainer of all things by his own power. This word is 
pharaon. This word for uphold. He is the pharaon. He bears, he upholds, and he sustains all ongoing activity in the universe. All that exists, the created order. Jesus is co-eternal. He's instrumental in the creation, and he upholds all things. I like this word pharaon because it's related to the word pharaoh. And I didn't know this, this when I started the study. But the Egyptians thought their pharaoh was a god. And his name spoke a little bit to this idea because they believed the pharaoh upheld all things by his power. He's the upholder of ma'at, the Egyptians believed. The chief priest, the chief judge, the lawmaker, the military leader, the upholder of morality and justice was the pharaoh. And they were wrong, weren't they? They're all dead now. But Jesus is the true pharaoh, the true pharaoh. He is the upholder of all things. And there are many scriptures that point this out. Titus 2, 13 and 14, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He gave himself for us and he is our great God. Here's a couple more verses. I love uh, what Paul writes here, speaking of the incarnation in 1 Timothy 3, verse 16. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh. God appeared. He was revealed. He was incarnated as a man. Jesus, the Son of God, manifested in the flesh. Most shocking of all, He died for our sins, and then He was resurrected by the Father in his glorified body as a man. And he still is a man. We went through Corinthians recently, and Shahe preached on this from 1 Corinthians 15, that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is still a man in his resurrected body. He gave himself for all, and he is our mediator between God the Father and us. Speaking of the Incarnation, Paul writes that we should have the mind that was in Christ Jesus. He astonishes us with profound uh, teaching here that Jesus, who was equal with God, became a servant. Let's read this verse. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Isn't that an amazing passage that Jesus did not think it robbery to be equal with God the Father, but he made himself of no reputation and became a bondservant and uh, appeared in the likeness of men in, in uh, his incarnation as a man. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 8, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Even more astounding, in Christ's subordinate position, the Father uh, was greater than he. This passage is an amazing passage. John 14, verse 28, the last part of it. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to my Father, for my Father is greater than I. Jesus subordinated himself to God the Father, and Paul puts his pen to the page and record something beyond our comprehension. How that Jesus became uh, subordinated to the Father. The Father was the authority for what Jesus said. And in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read this amazing verse. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Isn't that astounding that God the Son became a man, and God the Father became His head because of the Incarnation. As a side point, Jesus subjected Himself to God the Father, and imagine someday standing in judgment before the Lord Jesus, who made Himself of no reputation, expressed Himself in service, in obedience, in humiliation, in self-renunciation, and imagine trying to justify why you didn't want to do that. Imagine trying to explain to the Lord why you or why myself, why we are exceptions to that rule. Our society is all about asserting ourselves and standing up for our rights. Imagine explaining that to the Lord of glory, why we reject headship, why we disobey 
why we were filled with pride and hubris and we served domination over the people in our life. I don't think we want to be in that place. So Jesus is God. Did Jesus deny his divinity? This is the third question we wish to consider this afternoon. If Jesus rejected the premise that he was God, then we are wasting our time. One of the passages that some seize on to say that Jesus isn't and wasn't God is the record of the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus' response was, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. And so those who deny the deity of Christ seize on this verse and say, Aha, Jesus says there's only one good and I am not good. But actually, Jesus is doing the opposite. The young man had casually used the word good and uh, he was telling Jesus, You're a good teacher, in much the same way that a, uh, you might tell a PhD or a rabbi that they're a good teacher. But the Lord turns this conversational moment in a different direction. And he employs the term good rather in a relative sense. He uses it in an absolute sense. And he's seeking for a teaching moment with this rich young ruler. He's seizing on this language to drive home a tremendously important point. He's trying to lead this young man into deeper introspection about Christ. It's so Socratic, you might say. Uh, method of teaching, but he's trying to get the man to look at who Jesus actually is. And many of the commentaries back up this position. The pulpit commentary says, if you call me, this is a paraphrase, if you call me good, believe that I am God, for no one is good, intrinsically good, but God. R.C. Foster said, do you know the meaning of this word you apply to me in which you use so freely? There is none good save God. If you apply that term to me and you understand what you mean, then you affirm that I am God. So rather than a denial of his divinity, Jesus is asserting his divinity, which would be blasphemous to the Jews. Also in the uh, Gospel of John, many times the Lord says, I am, ego ami. In the Greek, he lays claim to the august and awesome name of God by saying this. Uh, John in his Gospel uses this 24 times, and perhaps the one you're most familiar with in John 8, 58 is when Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am laying claim to the name of God. The Jews certainly understood what Jesus was saying. They took up stones to kill him, and he had to escape their grasp. Another time is in John 18. Jesus says, I am he, and Judas and the rest of the crowd there who were trying to arrest him fell back and fell to the ground. Jesus said, I am. John also, in his gospel, has seven different places, seven absolute I am, I am sayings. The bread of life, the light of the world, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the life, the way, the truth, and the life, and the true vine. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, is demonstrating his divinity. And then finally, under this topic, if Jesus didn't claim to be divine, then certainly one place that he would have rejected something that was said to him is when Thomas, uh, doubting Thomas, had his unbelief swept away by the Lord, the resurrected Lord, and he says, Thomas says to the Lord, my Lord and my God. But instead of rebuking Thomas for blasphemy, Jesus confirms what he believes is the correct doctrine and gives a blessing to those who would believe even if they hadn't seen in verse 29. So, Jesus is our high priest, Hebrews 3. Jesus is a man. The man, Christ Jesus, he is our mediator, 1 Timothy 2, 5. He is the author and perfecter of our faith, Hebrews 12, the firstborn among many brethren. He is the captain of our salvation, Hebrews 2. He is consecrated a new and living way, Hebrews 10. He is not ashamed to call us brethren, Hebrews 2. And there's more. He is our intercessor, Romans 8. Firstborn from the dead, Revelation 1, 5. The bridegroom, the consolation of true Israel, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 5. And the last Adam. Jesus certainly did not reject his divinity, and the writers of the New Testament confirm that as they write about the Lord. All right, so now we come to a question, is Jesus worshipped in Scripture? Is Jesus worshipped?
praised and worshipped by those around him. Yes, he is. Jesus is, is worshipped before his incarnation, as a baby, as a young child, during his earthly ministry, after the resurrection, and in heaven. So basically, Jesus is worshipped uh, through all points in the scripture. Now, this might be a contentious issue for some, and so uh, hopefully I won't be held to account for this in the Q&A. Many people believe in Christophanies in the Old Testament, which is when the pre-incarnate Christ appears and is <coughs> worshipped. And Genesis 18 is an example, one of the three angels. Jacob wrestles with a man, Genesis 32, and Jacob said, I saw the face of God. The angel of the Lord appears to Manoah and his wife, the parents of Samson, Judges 13. The first person in the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar, like unto the Son of Man. And this section where Joshua here is walking near Jericho and he sees a man with a, a, a sword drawn. Joshua says, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? The individual responded as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face and, and this is the Hebrew word for proskuneo is the Greek and said, what does my Lord say to his servant? If that's not God, then uh, it is an angel that Joshua is worshiping. So I believe it is a Christophany. So Jesus was worshipped before his incarnation. He was worshipped as a baby. The Hebrew writer tells us that when God the Father brought the firstborn into the world, that the angels worshipped Jesus. When he brought the firstborn into the world in Hebrews 1 verse 6, let all the angels of God proskuneo, worship, and that means to fall on your face. And th by the way, that's a quote from the Septuagint. The Hebrew writer uses the Septuagint in this passage. It's not found in the Masoretic, as I understand it, and uh, showing us that at least portions of the Septuagint were inspired, at least used by the New Testament writers. So Jesus is worshipped as a baby, but he's also worshipped as a young child. The Magi came from the East after deciphering the writings of the greatest Persian Magi by the name of Daniel, and they worshiped Jesus. They came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they proskuneoed him. They fell on their faces and they worshiped the Lord as a young child. Jesus, of course, is worshiped during his earthly ministry. A leper uh, worshiped the Lord in Matthew 8, verse 2. He proskuneoed him and said, Lord, if you're willing, make me clean. The disciples worshipped him. Those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. That's Matthew 14. The Canaan, Canaanite woman uh, worshipped him. She came and said, Have mercy uh, upon me. And then down here it says that uh, Jesus said to her, I, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped, proskuneoed the Lord, and fell before him. So Jesus was worshipped during his earthly ministry. He was worshipped as well after the resurrection. As they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet, and they proskuneoed him, Matthew 28. When the disciples went away to the mountain Jesus had pointed for them, they saw him, and they once again worshipped him. Alan, during uh, our service yesterday, mentioned this scripture from Luke. Jesus is ascending to heaven. He was parted from them and carried away, and the scripture tells us that they worshipped him. They proskuneoed him and then returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So Jesus indeed was worshipped after his resurrection. And then Jesus is worshipped in heaven. If you take this as a future event, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb, each having a harp. And then they sing the song to the Lord. And so Jesus indeed, the Lamb, is worshipped in heaven. So I think we can confidently conclude not much controversy here, I would assume, that Jesus is worshipped in Scripture. So that brings us to the controversial portion of tonight's presentation, and that is, does Scripture command worship of Jesus for Christians? And we're going to break this down into uh, the language of worship, uh, and I have the four Greek words, the primary Greek words for worship, proskuneo, latruo, sabo, and uh, finally, Eusebio is the last one. So those are the four words that are used for worship in the uh, Greek New Testament. 
and we've mentioned proskuneo many times now. It's pro, it means to kiss toward, and actually it can mean uh, to lick like a dog, interestingly enough. That is, it shows you a little bit of the humility that you have when you do this. You are a very, showing very profound reverence. And in the Septuagint, in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar said, again, this is the Septuagint, so it's in Greek. He says to the three Hebrew young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you will proskuneo the golden statue that I have made. And they said, no, we won't. Here is a passage that you're fam very familiar with that we mentioned earlier, John 4, 21 through 24. And I believe there are eight times here when Jesus responds to this Samaritan woman and she says, or Jesus says to her question that you will proskuneo the Father, uh, but you worship uh, what you do not know. We worship what we do. Salvation is of the Jews. Here's an infamous example of the use of this word proskuneo. When the Roman soldiers were taunting and mocking our Lord Jesus Christ, one of the things they did after they struck him on the head with a reed and sped on him is they bowed the knee and then they proskuneoed the Lord, of course, in mockery. Uh, yesterday, Jerry gave us a sermon on the Ethiopian eunuch. He was going to Jerusalem to proskuneo God. And then here's another famous example when Cornelius had sent for Peter and Peter was coming to tell him of the gospel and obedience to baptism uh, to the name of Christ, call on the name of Christ. Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet and proskuneoed Peter. But Peter said, stand up for I am a man. Now, here's a bar graph and this word is used 60 times <coughs> in scripture. And I want you to notice that it's used Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John a significant number of times. And then in the book of Revelation, it's used 24 times. The majority of the times are in the Gospels and in, in the uh, book of Revelation. It's only used seven times in the Acts, Pauline epistles, Hebrews, and the general epistles. And in your handout, you can take the time to read it. I, I printed off all of these verses. In your handout... The seven times that it's used uh, in those places have nothing to do with the worship of Christ. In the general epistles, we have no reference of proskene in Christ. So, here's my conclusion for this section. In the Gospels and in the book of Revelation, we have examples of people worshiping Christ. However, in Acts, Pauline epistles, Hebrews, and the general epistles, proskuneo is not used to describe the worship of the Lord. Christians in the uh, church, worshiping in the church, are not commanded to proskuneo the Lord. So let's move on to the next word now. Uh, this word is uh, latruo. And this word basically means to serve. It's religious service. And usually it's priests in the book of Hebrews. But there is a woman, a widow of, uh, of 84 years, who did not depart from the temple serving latruo, God. She was Anna the prophetess of the tribe of Asher. Her service was described as Latruo. The devil, when he took Jesus up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, you should proskuneo me, Jesus. Jesus' response was, you shall proskuneo the Lord your God and him only shall you Latruo. So the Lord said, you shall uh, proskuneo God only and serve him only. Paul used this term in Romans 1 verse 9. He said, God is my witness whom I, Lutruo, I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And then one of my favorite verses in scripture, Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable Lutruo. Here's the bar graph of all the uses of Lutruo, 21 times and 21 verses. And in the New Testament, the, the word Lutruo, at least by my study, is never explicitly used for the worship of Christ. The third word then is the word sabo, and this means to be a devout worshiper. The most famous person that we have who was described this way is a woman by the name of Lydia, Acts 16, verse 14. When uh, on the second missionary journey, Paul and Timothy and Silas came to Philippi, they found Lydia, who was a sabo, a devout worshiper of God, and the Lord opened her heart. This word is also used in Acts 19.27 to describe wor worship to the great goddess Artemis. It's used in the Gospels. Jesus quotes God rebuking Israel in Isaiah 29. In vain do they sabo me, worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. Here's the bar graph for sabo. It's only used 10 times 
Again, in the New Testament, it is never explicitly used for the worship of Christ. And again, I have all those printed out if you want to read those uh, and uh, convince yourself of that fact. And then the fourth word, the final word, is eusebeo, and it means to show reverence. It's only used twice. One time is very important. It's when Paul was in Athens, and uh, he went and found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, therefore the one whom you worship. And eusebeo was this word here. The other time it's used of the respect that children are to show their parents. In the New Testament, this word is only used twice and is not used for the worship of Christ. We can't leave this topic without considering the universal Christological worship pa uh, passage of Philippians, which is from Isaiah. Uh, Nate is our Isaiah expert here, and I, I bet he studied this extensively. Isaiah uh, uses this. He says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. The word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. Paul then quotes Isaiah in Philippians chapter 2 and says God has given a uh, highly exalted him Jesus and given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul is using this as a great eschatological demonstration of Christ's deity to the world. The worship that God is owed in the Old Testament is uh, the worship that Christ is owed in the New Testament. However, this verb here is the aorist active verb, and Shahe can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but as I understand it, it means it's a future event. This is a future event. And also, notice the, the final qualifying fa uh, phrase here, that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, and you'll see why that's important in a moment. Dulos is this worship. We can discuss this in the Q&A. We are slaves to Christ. Paul and Timothy were bondservants of Christ. James was a bondservant of God and of Christ. Epaphras, Simon Peter, Jude, and so on. It's an inescapable idea that we are slaves to the Lord. Are there biblical examples of giving thanks to Jesus? Uh, eucharisto is the word in the Greek, and it means to give thanks, and it's regularly used for the giving of thanks to God. And it's used many times in the scripture, but always the thanks is given to God the Father. And I don't have time to read all of these, and it's not on your hound out. I should have included this, but giving thanks to God the Father, giving thanks to the Father, and so on. Many times it says, through Jesus Christ. There is one time in the scripture when Paul gives thanks to Christ, and this is found in 1 Timothy 1, and it has to do with the fact that Paul was placed into the ministry as an apostle and he says, I thank Christ Jesus who counted me faithful and put me into the ministry. But all the rest of the times, thanks is always to God the Father in Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. Here's some more passages. I thank my God through Jesus Christ. And whatever you do, this is the famous Colossians 3, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do we pray to Jesus? This is an important topic. When Jesus established prayer in Luke 11, he said that when you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Later, near the end of his ministry, he added to this that we are to pray in Jesus' name. And uh, here's some verses. He says, Ask the Father in my name. And that day you will ask in my name. And I shall not pray the Father for you, for you shall pray the Father. So we are to pray in Jesus' name. Some say that Stephen prayed to Jesus. This word epikalistai means to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 7, 59. Was Stephen praying to the Lord? I don't think so. First of all, we don't have all of Stephen's prayer, perhaps, and perhaps he addressed the Father. He's also having a vision of Christ who's standing at the right hand of God, and uh, it's a situation that's unusual. He's communicating directly with Christ. And thirdly, the point of the narrative of Luke here is to show these Pharisees that it is by calling on the name of Christ that you are saved. Christ is the Messiah. And so Stephen is making that point, and Luke is making that point by recording this, that it is through calling the name of Christ that you are indeed saved. Uh, 
from your sins. Did Paul call on Christ in 2 Corinthians 12? Did he pray to Christ when he said, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, the thorn in the flesh? Paul spoke with Jesus at least three other times that we know of where he had a conversation with the Lord. And so I don't think you can say that Paul was praying directly to Christ. May we sing to Jesus? Of course, we all know that we can. Ephesians 5, we are to make melody in our hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can pray to Christ. Colossians 3, 16 and 17, we are to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. But again, notice, this is important. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. So God is manifested as Jesus in the flesh. Jesus was divine. People worshipped him during his life on earth, and people worship him in heaven. However, in the church, Christians are never commanded to worship Christ, not a single time. The focus of worship in the church is upon God the Father through Jesus Christ. And so here we, here we go, the conclusion uh, of our sermon. Do Christians worship Jesus? Do we worship Jesus? My answer is yes, but. I have a yes, but answer. And Here's the way I look at this, and feel free to disagree in the, in the Q&A. Uh, we are told to obey Jesus, to be His bondservant, to follow after Him, to imitate Him, to love Him, to remember Him, to proclaim Him, not to be ashamed of Him, to abide in Him, to sing to Him, to pray in His name, to give thanks to God through Him, to do all things in the name of Jesus. But we're never told to worship Jesus, not a single time, in the Scripture. Uh, in the communion service, the most sacred memorial of all history, we're told to remember Jesus' death and to proclaim His death in so doing. I believe that the worship of Jesus is only possible through the approved scriptural paradigm, the pattern, the template of the New Testament, and the framework of the Godhead. If we are people of the book, we will worship God the Father through Jesus and in the Spirit. Anything outside this framework is non-scriptural because it's non-biblical. And many, many verses uh, exist to prove this point. We are a holy priesthood. We quoted this earlier. We offer up <laughs> spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We, through Him, have access by one Spirit to the Father. And we are an heir of God through Christ. And I really like what Peter says, uh, that if we speak, we speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, says, and this, I think this passage has uh, echoes of the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. We need to use biblical language and uh, we need to approach the worship of God the Father through Jesus Christ.